So, how was the day of practice so far? Was it good? You get, <laughs> get some rest from the business of the world. <laughs> I had another little um, thought about the answer about memorizing things. There, <laughs> there is one famous Savaka of the time of the Buddha, one of the disciples of the Buddha. His brother was very, very, very smart and he was able to memorize a lot of things, tons of things. And, uh, and uh, he was a monk and uh, the younger brother, he thought he was worthless because he wasn't able to memorize a single verse. <laughs> you know the story? <laughs> Maha Pandaka and Shula Pandaka. Yeah. And, uh, and the Buddha found, um, found uh, that um, the brother was kind of suggesting that the, uh, the, uh, the younger one disrobe because he couldn't intellectually kind of cope with the, all the uh, tasks and things like that. So Buddha, out of compassion, found this meditation object for him, gave it giving a piece of cloth and had him rub the cloth and repeat the word racho haranang, which means collecting dust, collecting dust, or collecting dirt. <laughs> and the Chula Pandaka saw how the cloth through rubbing it became stained and dirty over time and got enlightened by that. <laughs> so he didn't need to memorize uh, too much. and. Um, there's a few Dhammapada verses as well saying uh, better than a thousand verses is a single verse that brings peace and happiness, for example. So people's habits or uh, talents may be different. Some people are more intellectual and some people use the brain more for, uh, say, kind of contemplating the Dhamma and some people have more direct approach and um, don't don't have the capacity to even teach or explain what they're doing, they, but they're doing the right thing. So it's something uh, one has to find out about one's own um, character and one's own um, talents. It doesn't have to be, um, not everybody has to be super brilliant in the way he talks about the Dhamma. It can also be um, quite simple or some people can't say at all what they're doing. A lot of my friends in uh, in Thailand, they have difficulties giving Dhamma talks and um, some of them are really brilliant, give great Dhamma talks and they can go for hours and hours and others never say a word. <laughs> and uh, But they're very well practiced and they're very well, you say, kind of in the in the framework of the Dhamma without being able to verbalize it. So we can have both, like um, some people that are, I say, very convincingly um, vocal about the way they um, understand the Dhamma, and then we can also be very silent about it. So if one finds it's useful to memorize things, that's great. If not, then um, some people have an intuitive connection to um, to awareness and what is happening around them, and they are able to get peaceful without much um, triggering it or much much thinking about it. Mm. One thing to be careful is about that the uh, the ways of talking about Dhamma sometimes are not not exactly the same as the um, the feelings around the Dhamma, um, that the um, experience of the Dhamma is sometimes not something that you can express. And um, we tend to, like with education, we tend to um, many times uh, like, uh, you say, Dhamma talks that are really fascinating, intellectual, and uh, 
like a good like a good philosophy lecture and and it's part of the dhamma that is like that it's very logic very reasonable and uh, and um inspiring to the wise people but um it doesn't mean that the the speaker is necessarily a fully enlightened person just because he can talk about the dhamma in some way and for ourselves sometimes we think we we have understood something and we can explain it to ourselves but it's um, not yet real panya not yet past the test of real experience it's not real wisdom yet so um, to be careful about that is some in some ways we use the teachings to um, to generate an, an experience in our heart for example we use what we have heard what we've seen and uh, and teach ourselves for example through simple instructions when we meditate for example uh, we tell each other uh, um, life is not sure for example remind ourselves of death for example or we use contemplation of the the teachings for example and um, that um, the four elements um, in like um, or the five khandas we talk about the the body being not self but being just a, a composite form of the five khandas but to realize that and uh, and to really understand it is a is a very big task it's not just something one can just easily tick off by a comment or by an easy answer and um, so there's a gap between panya which is real wisdom and sanya which is memory things that we have like uh, heard and or like uh, one can also say suttamaya panya panya that comes from having heard something for example having heard uh, at the um, uh, a, a good Dhamma talk and uh, you feel now you've taken something away from that and uh, it's that's already a part of, of wisdom but it's still preliminary wisdom it's like wisdom of having heard something from somebody else and uh, and that's already a great thing because like sometimes we hear a lot of rubbish and uh, not things that aren't really panya we hear stuff that's advertising things we hear political speeches we hear talk about um fake news <laughs> whatever we hear usually it's even uh, it, it cannot even be real sutta maya banya because the stuff that was that we have been her hearing isn't at all any banya there is no no wisdom in it really or like uh, say political speeches sometimes really off-putting how how little wisdom there is, how much lies and conceit there is in there, and how much um, tactics that are deviating from honesty, and uh, so that this is not. Uh, no matter how much you carry that along, it it will not, never qualify as panya, <laughs> and uh, or teachings that are really simply wrong. If somebody tells you, if you give a lot of money, you'll go to heaven for eternity. Uh, so this is like a, one of the teachings of wrong view. <laughs> it's just simply wrong view. <laughs> and somebody tells you uh, it's better to be male than female, or so. <laughs> it's just not in line with reality. <laughs> so then, so no matter how much you listen to that, it it won't ever create any panya. But if you listen to the uh, to the Dhamma, say for example the Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta, the teaching of the a turning of the wheel of Dhamma, then uh, you can at least you, you keep it and you have heard it and you can contemplate it and that, and that's like what we were talking about. Somebody gives you uh, some information and you hear the information, you keep it with you and you store it up and then you're able to possibly recognize situations that work um, when when the time comes that it, you're right uh, right in the moment where you face, for example. Dukkha, and, uh, or like you, uh, you see <coughs> that um, the uh, say um, that the facing of dukkha or the um, encounter of dukkha is already part of the process of 
of realizing how to how to deal with dukkha. This is like um, encoded in the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta. So if you have those teachings in mind, then you can actually compare your your life, your situations with them. So Sutta Maya Panya is is important. Then there's Chinta Maya Panya, which means like Panya that comes through um, for, through thinking or through um, through uh, ways of like applying the mind, which then is um, many times a bit like what I understand is what we're doing when we are being creative in our thoughts and uh, finding finding so to say finding the truths about life by our own uh, by our own ways of creative thinking. For example, we see um, <coughs> that. Um, we derive some some truths about the uh, about what's happening with the world, for example, through so observing and through aligning it with our, our reasoning, and uh, we arrive at the Dhamma. In, uh, for example, we understand that things are not permanent. There's change. There's climate change, for example. We uh, make an effort to apply our mind, or we. Um, ponder upon the Dhamma, we understand that, um, say for example, concepts that are difficult to understand in the, in the suttas, then we try to interpret them and we try to align them with, with what, um, what we think, how they work together. Say we connect, for example, things that we've heard from one sutta with another sutta, even though the, the Buddha didn't say, please connect those, but we apply our mind and uh, we have got this discursive thinking and make it uh, more, uh, align it together. And this is Chinta Maya Panya. So we reflect upon the Dhamma, we, we process it. And I would say this is many times as good as it gets in Western philosophy. Um, that it's a, a thought product. People are, are very smart. For example, I, uh, I remember reading Immanuel Kant, um, a German philosopher, and it's definitely very, very beautiful teachings, very beautiful, um, say, description of the part of truth that he, he found was, uh, was available for a good thinker, and uh, brilliant in many ways, and many students up to this day still get a headache on reading his teachings and there's more complicated people and put their, their truth in word. Um, but um, it, and no matter what, like um, whether Immanuel Kant or other philosophers, philosophers were able to really go to the central points of like what is, what is really relevant and um, whether they really had right view or not, this is one question. But um, what I'm trying to aim at is to say, even though they may have had very, very genuine Dhamma thoughts, I think Immanuel Kant had still quite a lot of internalist views, and uh, like it was very Christian actually, after all thoughts he put in there. So he kind of didn't fully hit the hit the mark of say um, nothing in the world um, being as a self in itself, something like he was actually looking for the thing in itself. <laughs> so, so for example, there's lots of misconcepts. That, that's one thing, one problem. But um, the the other one is that he actually his his teachings or his way of looking at his mental constructions actually didn't lead to a practice, didn't lead to himself looking at how can I overcome my my bad habits for example he has got this very beautiful golden rule or like the categorical imperative like you do to uh, to others as you wish to be done to yourself and uh, this is a very very beautiful concept and you can actually say yeah that's a real real dhammic concept in many ways but if you don't practice like that and you're not able to uh, integrate this into your life and realize uh, the capacity to do that, then that's not real panya, that's still a th mental kind of mental construction, chinta maya panya. And um, what we consider the highest form is bhavana maya panya. And why I want to say <laughs> Immanuel Kant, he was super, super great thinker, but there's some anecdotes about his life 
that are that you can you can see actually he was a pretty angry person and he had no no means of holding back his anger. He was suing one of his neighbors for <laughs> for for his cock um, doing his cock a doodle do while Emmanuel was thinking, pondering around his theories and uh, he started a lawsuit because like he felt too angry <laughs> about I mean, somebody else was like obstructing his philosophy from being born. <laughs> so it's a very German habit actually to be very, very <laughs> angry angry and righteous. I you know, this is a story I don't know whether deep down in his heart he had absolute meta and I don't know, but I assume that many of the philosophers they were up up in their head and they never made the and uh, never made the step to realize the very complicated theories about reality and about like how life is, how life should be, and what's a good life. They didn't really put the effort into practice. And uh, so the Bhavana Maya Panya is um, like the Panya that arises through practice, through cultivation of the mind. And this is where we meditate and many times take simple simple truths that don't need to have a completely silent room, for example, where there's no cocks or um, or what are they call cuckoo bearers. <laughs> and, but we, we're actually right there in reality, but we use um, very simple exercises for our mind to understand what's happening with our sense of um, uh, peace, sense of um, uh, understanding a sense of like um, separation from of ourselves from others, like um, for example, the feeling of a self. We try to analyze this with very very simple um, factors of, that the Buddha suggested, and and this um, this can can be very intuitive. It doesn't have to be something that you have to study a lot for. I would say, as a rule of thumb, in many ways, like uh, I think. In our tradition, we do a little bit of chanting, and uh, and it's the the things that we chant usually are very very core teachings, and uh, they can guide all of us very very easily to integrating the Buddha's teachings into our experience in a way that it really can become bhavana maya panya, where we really feel that this this is this must be true, or like we feel we can. Um, uh, rise up to this standard of of truth bit by bit by our practice. Um, for example, the um, the four noble truths, the four truths of the noble ones, and the uh, about dukkha and uh, about things that are um, unpleasant, painful, or dis dissatisfactory, or frustrating, stressful, annoying, and uh, disheartening, and depressive. <laughs> yeah, all this is called dukkha. And um, the idea of um, that the Buddha pronounced in his, in his first teaching, that dukkha is something to be understood, to be seen, to be um, uh, realized that that we're actually f working with with hardships that we're not running away from hardships that but that we're trying to um, fully understand what what dukkha is this is like a real a real big task for somebody who practices and um, and works with it and it's not the idealist point of view that through meditation we're on cloud number nine and that's it. <laughs> that, that would be already the end of um, of, of the path. But um, to to start the practice with realizing, no, it's not easy. It, there's a lot of things happening here. We see them come and go. We see how frustrating it can be. And the first realization is, this is dukkha. This is not easy. This is suffering. This is frustrating. And then we, from that point, we already open up one level of, of our heart and already is <coughs> are ready to um, to take in the next part of where we we say okay so what's what's the the cause and uh, 
how how does it work and so repeated experience we sometimes like are actually shown the cause directly if we are open to it so it's very actually very um, direct approach it's not so much one needs to uh, study about it in many periods in many in many circles like there is a kind of um, separation between samatha and vipassana Vipassana is mean, means like really to penetrate into the uh, truths of the of the Dhamma to really see through or like uh, have the liberating knowledge that comes through through understanding and the uh, the, the teachings or understanding um, the the life as it presents it itself in and understanding the Dhamma. This is Vipassana. You're surely aware of the, that term. And so it's a, like panya in action, and uh, so the, the vipassana and panya they're one one part of the of the uh, the, the practice, whereas then the samatha or practicing samadhi and um, and peace and uh, utter sensation and the feeling of um, un being undisturbed and uh, quiet, this is the other other part. Of the of the teachings, as as you know, like uh, it's one of the factors of the noble eightfold path that we have, samma samati, which means like um, like uh, the uh, the attainment of the of the higher absorptions of the mind, for example, is a very important part, and uh, many times these two are are contrasted towards each other, and it, I would just um, say when when we are meditating. Um, and so many times people are trying to uh, to force um, an, a sense of peace on themselves and trying to um, convince themselves that one is peaceful, but the peace doesn't arise from one one from one's own say kind of enthusiasm or from one's own um, natural natural drive. So. With Ajahn Chah's teaching, many times he combines those two. He he just says like um, when you practice, you have to have both ways, like uh, the the ways of somebody who uses panya or vipassana, and and the ways of using the quiet mind, the still mind. And in fact, it can alter that there are um, periods where the mind really easily inclines towards peace, and then you open up your eyes and you actually integrate the truths about life as as you observe them so that it that would be the peace of mind uh, being a foundation for um, insight to come with the other way around is possible as we understand from Ajahn Chah's teachings as well that you build up an understanding and uh, and the uh, I say on the level of of the uh, Preliminary panyas like um, Sutta Maya, Jinta Maya, and Panya, and maybe a bit of Bhavana Maya and Panya. You try to integrate um, what you know about the teaching, what you have heard that the Buddha recommended to us. For example, see the world as as um, uh, as empty. Then the Lord of Death won't see you. This is a famous quote. And, you know, we've heard that, and we. We find that fascinating. We want to test it. We want to see reality as if it was empty. We pretty well know it's not empty. This room um, contains a lot of atas here, <laughs> and uh, and this body contains an atta. So we 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 know we're not there yet. That we see things empty, but we make this supposition. We think, suppose everything was empty. Suppose the what if I were to see everything only in the four elements, like just see you, you as physical entities, like a materialist would do or so. So we make this, like um, we teach ourselves to change the way we view um, the, the world by, by the teachings. So this is like um, taking the kind of like, uh, the, I would say the Panya approach or the approach of using um, the uh, using one's vipassana fa faculties, and already we already know the answer. The Buddha already told us it's anicchang dukkang anatta, and there's only the four noble truths, and uh, there's only dukkha and, uh, the, and, and the cessation of dukkha that he taught. So we can take those very 
four or five summaries of the Buddha's teachings and test them through our um, through our way of applying our mind. And this is a real, a real definite um, practice that then changes the way we feel inside, and it it can easily um, bring a sense of peace and 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 uh, long longing to go inwards. So sometimes when we reflect a lot about the body, about the world, about nature, about our surroundings, about other people, about the, uh, say, conditioned reality, then sometimes the mind just says, okay, let this all settle, and then it goes into um, samatha, it goes into peace. This is one of the things that Ajahn Chah many times said, you practice with both parts. So I've already talked again quite quite a bit. If actually this is supposed to be Q and A, <laughs> anybody has some uh, things? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, Dhamma Vijaya is one step further. Like um, in in one way, yes. I'm not quite sure how they how they work together, but I would say yes. In if you if you use the Dhamma that is like a genuine Dhamma and you investigate it, you ponder upon it, you uh, proliferate, <laughs> you construct a little more. At the same time, this is also um, Dham Dhamma Vijaya is, is one of the enlightenment factors. So I think the Buddha meant when he said about um, Dhamma Vijaya, it has to be already something that is very, very close to the, yeah, close to the heart, close to direct experience. And um, so I, I would assume that, like, um, I'm not not a hundred percent sure about the pariyati. Maybe actually, do you know about this a little bit about like whether Chintamaya Panya and uh, Dhamma Vichaya would be um, Dhamma Vichaya would fall into Chintamaya Panya? Wouldn't, wouldn't the uh, like you said, Dhamma Vichaya would apply to the noble one? Dhamma Vichaya is, is like one of the Bojangas, so it is it is some it's a high real it's it's at least it's an a step to uh, of the of the of the yeah it's a strong practice so I assume actually the that it is it is one of the <coughs> it, one of the things that immediately has has like um, an effect on the on the on the heart on the on the uh, re reduction of the defilements on the Abandoning and, uh, and, and the cultivation of your own own mind. It's not it's not mere theory. So Chintamaya Panya, I would say, is still mere theory. It would be, um, but um, yeah. Because through the practice, you go into the Yes, you go exactly. Yeah. Like. Yeah, right, right. Mindfulness becomes a bojanga. It's not a normal step. It is a very, um, a very special, special um, sort of mindfulness that develops to that. Similarly to, um, say, vipassana is used in a very, um, say, in a preliminary step, like I just said, like one uses vipassana techniques to teach oneself about things that one has actually heard and taken over. But real vipassana is is the is the insight into truth. That's enlightenment somehow. So it's like um, it depends on how which shade one put, like uh, which grade one puts on on this. But I would say, for us, it is it is really good to to think yes, dhamma vijaya is one of the bojangas. Let me cultivate the bojanga. Let me practice cultivate this aspect and come uh, to to look at the. Um, Look at the, uh, reflect on the Dhamma, investigate the Dhamma, and do, um, say to say, do vipassana in in a way of in instructing yourself. It it can um, it can also come the other way around that you after have, having had a very uh, very peaceful sit, then suddenly um, your mind just captures what is Dhamma and what is not, and uh, and you see see things that you haven't seen before like and and th this would be the dhamma vijaya that comes from from a say from a real peaceful mind that's probably the, the similar to real vipassana
time in the, in the serious state, the developed state. Do you have to have Samatha Bhavana develop up to the jhana level to understand the real person? I, I, I don't don't really know because uh, I, I think Ajahn Chah many times imply it didn't 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 teach like that. It seemed seemed like um, maybe yes, but I come to think in terms of if I if I use um, uh, vipassana, it's it's not worth it because I don't have samatha yet. I think that's the that's the wrong way of approaching it. Because all the um, all the preliminary vipassana that is not really penetrating deep enough, I think this will will help you um, at the time when uh, samatha comes, at the time when you have one of the uh, when you have the um, jhana states, it will help you to um, to take your mind directly to the to the important points. I think um, it's a it's a building up of energy that is like a head start in terms of vipassana contemplation, which is necessary at, at, uh, eventually. And um, if if one wouldn't have that, like, or wouldn't apply oneself, or would evade, for example, to apply oneself to the vipassana way of analyzing things, because one has had very good samadhi and was very well, say, established in that and uh, possibly didn't want to budge from that. That would be one of the classic tracks, uh, uh, traps that our teachers warn us from, that one has to actually deliberately arouse something that stirs up vipassana and, and practice uh, deliberately to face dukkha or the unbeautiful or things like that. So I've heard um, teachers in our tradition, for example, Ajahn Anand, he mentioned as an encouragement, don't think the amount of time you put into vipassana, which isn't yet genuine vipassana, um, don't think that's lost. It gives you a head start in having already built up your thinking and um, your, your contemplative patterns right to the point once once you then develop samatha, then it will it will just go right right through. It'll, you'll you'll you won't have to do much work anymore in contemplating things. The other side is that like um, having a thorough application to the mind towards the dhamma in the vipassana style, in the panya style, the effect can come in as well that you just don't want to think anymore, you just don't want to contemplate anymore, you just want to rest, then the mind naturally inclines towards peace and then um, the, the um, samatha um, or jhana factors will, will ripen and you, you'll have um, the, 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 other, the other component of the ingredient. So in that sense, I do think it's probably necessary. I, I'm not such an expert in the theory about it, but I, the way I see it is that we don't have to um, judge it too much, because um, whatever we are inclined to, whatever is our starting point, is a valid starting point, and it leads to the other one. That's for me. That's the most important part. Yes, sure. Yes, yeah. It can it can be, of course. For example, tamakamata, love for dhamma, is such a powerful source of pity, sukha, and happiness. It's one of the jhana factors. I, I don't, I don't know really like um, how other monks practice and how other, how other ajans how, um, how they approach this. But lately, I met, had the chance to meet. Somlet Puttakosa Chan, he's uh, one of the most famous scholars in Thailand, P.A. Payuto, and he's written a lot of um, very, very beautiful books. And he's such a beautiful person, such a humble person. And he gets so much joy out of the Dhamma, just like he's very sick actually. He's always, always on the, on the merge of collapsing all, <laughs> most of his life. He's been always a weak, 
kid already and he was sent to the monastery because he was too weak more or less to do anything else <laughs> and he started this brilliant career uh, as a as a as a buddhist scholar and thinker and uh, and he's more or less revolu revolutionized the way of like thai thai buddhism is is seen and and, and understood in thailand and I, and I fully believe, I, if anybody was to tell me he was an enlightened person, I, I would say yes. <laughs> Just because of his like, a convincing energy when you meet him and the feeling of like, but he doesn't talk in that way. Like, um, so even for somebody who is a mere scholar, I do believe that there is so much Dhamma energy that can contribute to those other factors that are missing on the path to be balanced that if he wasn't enlightened yet then at the cause of like um, him like for example at the cause of death or at the cause of when when the final letting go of like one's life forces has to take place I think he'd be very close and uh, things are about to merge maybe they haven't merged yet because his karmic disposition goes towards being a scholar and being a thinker, and um, but like the qualities of his thinking generate so much positive energy, and you just want to be around a person like that. He's just such a gentle person and such a beautiful person. I'm sure you've met other monks that are like that. Their enthusiasm of dhamma just shows that they um, they're really settled in themselves. And so, if one thinks about dhamma kamata or like. Um, the joy of Dhamma or the love for Dhamma being such a very important factor and, um, and then understands that how important piti, sukha and, uh, are for um, developing jhana. I think probably uh, some that Payuto would, would easily, easily qualify. <laughs> so, so this is just my, my, my analysis, whether it's right or not, but it's an example of somebody that doesn't sit meditation for hours, doesn't um, <clears throat> this, doesn't do um, say any of the say classical forest monks practi practices, but to my understanding, he gains the highest, highest honors of of um, what what can be achieved in the practice. His, his vehicle is just very diff different. It, it's also in line with many of the um, things that we hear in the in the suttas about the different characters. Of monks and uh, the savakas, or like the um, the different practices, like chula pandaka, just having having a simple simple parikama, like a racho haranang, and uh, applying himself to that, or and then uh, sariputta and mahamokalana, very different, and it sona. sona, yes, yes, with the lute. There's so many colorful examples that it feels like one builds up the right qualities that are applicable to one's own personal karmic disposition and um, fully puts one's energy into that and cultivates that bhavanas that like and and works with that with full um, full creativity, full energy and turns away from the world and turns away from dukkha and whatever factor is still not included will easily make its way in because like it's all very close already because we're very far away from the world already somebody uh, spends a life for example um, contemplating a um for example like uh, it's a very big hurdle for many many people but if you do that all the time and you create a sanya for example the unbeautiful sanya the like even though that's not not in one of the first first suttas of the Buddha, or it's not one of the uh, things that he talks with uh, about lay people or so, but it, it's, a, it's a very, very important practice for monks. If one feels one, one constantly teaches oneself to see the world as, as um, say, kind of loathsome, like, um, like um, the uh, perception of, of the corpse, for example, or so, then um, maybe still one hasn't developed jhana or still one hasn't developed, like, um, say, other parts of the Dhammavichaya, but the effort it takes and the um, aloofness from the world that comes from, from this practice and the compatibility of this to all the others, I think will make it very easy to integrate the rest of the, the, the practice.
So I, I, I trust in that. I'm, I'm not sure um, how how this is like um, seen from scholarly parts. I, I, I do know that the, the the Thai forest teachers many times they take it in this very creative approach. Yes, you do what you 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 feel is really inspiring for you, and you you cultivate that a lot, and you use that f faculty a lot. And many of the um, monks in in Isa, and they're not thinkers. They're not like like us that we've gone to university or have been put through an education system. Many of them still are only um, educated to primary school, and um, and they they express the Dhamma very simple and directly. But um, and they, they wouldn't be able to um, to explain things or uh, see it even. Analytically, is this vipassana, is this samatha, or so? But they intuitively would dedicate themselves to the task, and they have a lot of faith as well. That sometimes uh, they um, emulate not the teachings, but the teacher. They see certain qualities in the teacher, and they try to emulate them by by being like 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 the teacher, or put a lot of effort into upataking, for example, like uh, attending to their teacher. Like Venerable Ananda, and um, I was once asked a question: Didn't Venerable Ananda waste a lot of his life? Couldn't he could have attained much earlier if he had not been the Buddha Upatak for 25 years? But <laughs> practiced, <laughs> practiced <laughs> jhana, <laughs> and uh, so I thought, wow, okay, it never occurred to me like that. And for me, the Ananda is like a, a simile, a simile of like even through service. And devotion and and memorizing the teaching, yes, yeah, yeah, just more or less not to denigrate Venerable Ananda at this time, but like to say Sutta Maya Panya, <laughs> yeah, even so reproducing the teachings like and recording them and keeping them, you're so close to having all the other factors of the past come in that one doesn't need to worry about it. <laughs> well, we have like um, only only um, basic sutta studies. Like we, most of the monks do do um, do study a little bit. Like, um, but um, for this, it's it's a bit of a division. The forest tradition is a bit and say anti-scholar one could say um, because like i think it's a bit like generally uh, the there's there's also quite a scholarly attitude in 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 many city monasteries and um it can come across a bit arrogant and the uh, and the far forest monks may become across arrogant in a different way <laughs> i don't know about the, 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 there is a bit of a say rivalry like um and and also maybe jealousy. The forest monks, uh, they, <coughs> the, right now is like um, the pride of of the Thai, Thai Buddhist um, sasana is like um, the you know, lineage of Lumpur Man. Like, it's like um, so highly esteemed. But Lumpur Man did a lot of um, chanting. I think what we do is a lot of uh, like rather than studying, we do a lot of chanting. We use the 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 suttas or the the text in a in a more devotional way, or like a more energizing way. It, it, but it depends on the character, I would say. <coughs> the, um, I think it really also there will be a change. I think there's more more education altogether in Thailand now. And um, more um, more studies, and people go through school systems much more than before. And I think their inclination will be just like us to like to feed the an analytical mind in in one way. But Ajahn Chah, he many times he he I think he had like basic basic dhamma dhamma lessons, like which is like um, the standard dhamma. Dhamma exams in Thailand, they're not difficult. I think anybody of us could could pass them if we had the the language skills and, and so forth. And it's not the um 
the contents isn't isn't too complicated. It's like a shorthand of of all kinds of um, dharma lists and uh, dharma dhammapada quotes, and um, many of the Pali quotes that Ajahn Chah quotes are from these uh, from these um, dharma basic dharma lessons. I think in Sri Lanka you have a Buddhist Buddhist Sunday school, and uh, it's one of the 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 hallmarks of um, Sri Lankan. Our culture is the Buddhist education as well, much higher. Yeah, even in school. Yeah, yeah. I think it's very valuable, and it's a bit of a shame that Thailand goes all worldly with their education. That they're cutting out more and more of the Dhamma lessons in the curriculum. And. Um, yeah. Yeah. Pulling them back. Yeah. I think um, the uh, the basic the basic teachings, for example, now in the present forest tradition, I think they're conveyed to the monks and to the lay people through our chanting. Actually, we we do not only just morning evening chanting. We do also the uh, Anapanasati Sutta, the Noble Eightfold Path, the Dhammacakapavatta. Matana Sutta in translation, so everybody has like more or less the key definitions of the terms as they are standard in in Thailand at their fingertips, and uh, and so in in that sense, it's it's good enough to communicate or to use for um, contemplation. So, but um, in terms of um, Abhidhamma studies or um, even Vinaya studies, I think Thailand isn't up to scratch with Burma and Sri Lanka. I think. <laughs> Excuse me? Vipassana. Vipassana. I don't know that. that, that <laughs> <way>. <laughs> Do you know? Yeah, Sanskrit, yeah. Sanskrit. Could be, yeah. Dasana, dasana seeing or dashana could be the same word. I, there's um, yeah, yathapu thangyana dasana, for example. Like that, that's where the, where the word dasana comes up from my, my um, memory. Like in, and knowing in um, <coughs> uh, knowledge and um, according to uh, truth, yatha bhutang, jnana dasana, um, knowledge and uh, and and vision. Yeah, that's so that's vision. vision, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I, I to be honest, I'm not such a knower of Pali, but um, I, I haven't heard this vidarshana, but it could be. Some some other form of vipassana. It seems close enough. <laughs> <laughs> you, have you heard of it? Okay. okay, I see. Yeah. As you said, the vipassana is the view. View, yeah. As a seeing, whether one takes it active or passive, one views or one sees. <laughs> Yes, it's exa exactly it's like the front and back of the hand. Or like if you lift up a, a log, one side is samatha and one side is vipassana. You have to lift up both. And um, for example, like in doing contemplation of the body, um, the gaya kata sati patana, or like asupa kamatana. If you look at what the Visuddhimagga says about like how, whether this is classified as samatha or vipassana, I was surprised it's actually classified as samatha. Looking at the contemplating, contemplating the body and looking at the 32 parts of the body, for me, my, my understanding is when I use that, I use that as a, like a teaching myself, more or less verbally in my brain, this is the body. These are the parts, and I go through them analytically, 
And um, so I'm, I've got a very, very active thinking mind. It's very far away from samatha. But um, if one does this a long time, um, sometimes like you have asupanimitas coming up. You have like um, pictures like that arise into the uh, in in your vision that um, are showing you parts of the body in a very direct and compelling way. And uh, and this this. Um, jump from a mere contemplation of the externals to something that is generated by, um, by, by the mind, an animita, then is probably what leads then to samatha. If then there is an asupanimita coming up, for example, you're contemplating the bones and skeleton and you have a the very vivid nimitta of the, of the skeleton or the, the, um, the matter of the bones, like um, the whitishness or the powderishness of bones that are crushed and, and so forth. This can lead to um, samatha, can lead to um, moving away from the, um, from the particulars of, the, of this meditation object, which is very broad, and it can lock into a, a single aspect and then very calmly kind of focus in there and then and more or less lock itself up in one aspect of this of this um, uh, 32 parts of the body in a very particular way and then become very, very calm and um, be a grounds for samatha. So this is also an exa example how an analytic approach through application of the mind and sustained attention and sustained contemplation can, can lead to all the factors of, of jhana coming up. The, the nimittas usually when they, if there's an, uh, a super nimitta coming up, it's not something that you feel uh, um, uh, averse to, but it's something that is uplifting the heart. It's a very joyous and over uh, fascinating state. You're seeing, seeing things like um, the bones from a different angle or so. And, it, and this is, makes it clear that then this can also immerse into a state of samatha. So I think it's three thirty, and I think Ajahn Damasi has come to say hello and goodbye. <laughs> so I've talked a lot, but I think I've circled around a few topics. I hope that they are for for news for for all of you. And if there's anything that may have been incorrect or like in a roundabout the way, a way that we speak in the Thai forest tradition, if you have any further, further contemplations on that anal analysis or you, you look it up in the scriptures and there's doubts about it, then please um, ask Ajahn Damasiha and other experts in future sessions about it and, and don't and uh, don't um, take it too serious because I think the main thing is to be very open with one's um, inclination to investigate these things and not to shut down and this only this is true, everything is el else is wrong and they, um, be able to investigate thoroughly. So this may be only a little starting point. Couple.